to the session today about UX is not only for designers. Uh, it's, a, it's a title a bit provocative, but it's on purpose because uh, typically everybody thinks that the UX is a designer's job. And so uh, it's always uh, given to the designer to handle it. However, we think it's different. And this is not going to be the, the talk today. So just a quick brief about myself. I'm Faris Amara. I'm the CTO and Program Manager of Speed at DDD, which is a startup accelerator based in Beirut. And we invest in startup at the early stage, and we also provide them a three-month support program. Uh, before Speed, I spent nine years as in technology. I did development, I did QA, I did project and product management, I did uh, deployment on the cloud as well. Uh, so why am I doing a UX talk? Uh, the journey started, uh, when, when I started with Speed, UX seemed to be an extremely important part of what startups have to do. And the understanding their users and building something for their users is extremely critical. Um, but I got more interested in the summer uh, when Google came in and gave something called the UX Master Class. And the purpose of the master it was a two-day workshop where they taught teams how to actually implement the UX process uh, within the, their daily development. And I took this class and I really enjoyed it. And they also asked us if, we, if I'm interested in becoming a trainer. There should be a few other trainers here as well. So now there are six trainers who are trained by Google to provide those two-day master classes in Beirut over the coming year or two. And so the plan is that we're going to be having one workshop uh, every month. And uh, that workshop is uh, we're going to be recruiting teams from five to eight teams on that for every workshop. And the purpose of this class now is to give you also an idea about this, and hopefully, if you're interested, to actually I'll let you apply to that workshop. So just to get an idea first about the crowd here, who of you is a designer? Who's a designer? Okay. Developers. Okay. QA. Wow, there's one representative for you. Okay. Uh, project product managers, uh, startup founders, because you do everything. <laughs> Anything else I missed, guys? Uh, marketing, yeah. Anyone for marketing? <laughs> so the purpose for today is uh, we want to learn, we want to talk about the fundamentals of user-centered design. And uh, we're going to try to learn some techniques of how you can start implementing the part of your team. Okay, and you just have fun, meet people who are interested in your ex and exchange your information after that. That's the most important part. So I'm going to start with the UX process. And, uh, <coughs> is it good? I'm going to start with the UX process. And the first question is, and I would, please would love you to engage with me on this. Uh, what is UX? What do you think is UX? How do you use an experience design? What do you think it is? Yeah. It's the way you start Okay. Okay. Fair. Anything else? Any other opinion on what is UX? User experience. Sorry? User experience. User experience? Okay, what does it mean, a good user experience? Yeah. Digital marketing? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Designing the interaction, interactions uh, of users with our application or product, service, whatever. Okay. Uh, Why? Just uh, researching and studying the behavior of the customer and why and how he will use our product. Fair. Interesting. Uh, so there's, there's one distinction I just want to make here because it's a typical point that I used to confuse as well. So there's user experience and user experience design. And typically when we say UX, it actually stands for user experience design, which is the process of ensuring a good user experience. So user experience is getting some for the user to actually feel good while he's doing the application, so that he actually gets what he needs to do in a pleasant manner. It's all about how he feels while he's executing. But the process itself is 
want to do everything you can to actually find out, to figure out what the user needs, and to actually build something that the user wants to use and is going to enjoy <coughs> and is going to feel pleasant doing. Uh, the question is, why does it matter? And it's a simple question. Answer is that we're in the digital age, and the apps are just. And your competitor is a tap away. It's easily somebody else can download your competitor, your, comp your competition, and then you're going to lose your users. So it's extremely important to maintain those users. So I'm going to talk now about the five fundamentals of user experience design. And the first fundamental is focus on the user. It's pretty straightforward. But the idea is that you want to design for the users, you don't want to design for yourself. Can I say, can you share uh, No, they're not going to be sure. So the idea is to focus on the user, and uh, th that's the main uh, part. Okay. So the, the decision making should be revolving around that. Um, who of the developers here uh, spent hours and days in a meeting room discussing what the user would want without even talking to them? I've done it. I'm guilty. Don't be ashamed to say that you've been guilty about it as well. Uh, we often forget what the users, uh, what they want, and we start building something for us. So that's extremely important. Uh, the second fundamental is solve real problems. Problems that are worth solving. We don't want to solve problems that are insignificant. Because if they're insignificant, then your user is not going to be interested in using the application in the first place. So try to solve real pain points for or if in case you're building an entertainment app, a real need uh, that the user would want to engage with. Uh, the third uh, is strive for simplicity. Um, who remembers, I mean, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, we had a lot of search competition. We had Google, we had Yahoo, we had MSN, we had the endless scroll of the Yahoo homepage. Um, but you had the search bar of Google, just a search bar. It's, it's as simple as that. These are the these are extremely important uh, fundamentals that Google adopt, and that's why they've been successful so far. Just simple search bar that got them to be where they are today. The fourth and probably the most critical one is do your research, and we're going to touch more on that on how to do the research, and specifically in the master, the two-day master class, there's a full day dedicated on the research techniques and what you can, and the different techniques that you can do. I'm going to give you a taste on them today. Uh, but you have to do your research. You don't want to make any assumption. And if you make an assumption, you go out there and you validate that assumption. And you come back. So you always have to be driven by the metrics and by the numbers. And what the users are telling you on their feedback. And the fifth and the simplest one is probably adapt, adapt, adapt. It's easy to say it, hard to execute. But you always have to continuously change. Your product is never done. It's never a complete product. It always has to evolve. Uh, they got through it. Sorry about that. But so that's the five fundamentals uh, uh, of uh, UX. Uh, any questions so far about the five? Right. So I'm going to talk about something that, which is called the iterative process. And, um, you know, typically speaking, we uh, develop a life cycle, we build the product, we launch the product, and then we just pray. <laughs> There's, and this is definitely a linear, non-iterative process, and it's not right, it's not what we're supposed to be. We have to be a bit smarter than that. And the idea is you want to become more cyclical. And so you want to design, and then you want to build, and then you want to launch, and then you want to evaluate. And you can't have to, but also that's not good. Evaluating after launch is not is not the only time where you have to evaluate. You have to evaluate at every stage, and you have to do your research at every stage. And each stage has a different form of research that's going to help you understand what the users want. And we're going to touch on that. So just your turn, guys. Um, I just want you to tell me why you wrote. What are the fundamentals that we talked about you are actually not now implementing in your teams? What do you think you're doing well? Mahada's doing anything? <laughs> you got it. Research? Who said so? OK. What else? Sorry? A B testing. A B testing. OK. That's a good form of research. OK. We're going to touch. Uh, it's a qualitative. Quantitative, sorry. 
Service design? Yeah. <coughs> Listening. We listen after we launch to all the feedbacks and we redesign again and redesign. Okay, great. Why do you stop? What are you not doing well? Adaptation? Okay. What else? Time. Time? Okay, but that's not, the, that's not part of the process. You have Keep imitating. on learning. Keep learning. on learning. Okay. Evaluation. 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 Okay, you're not doing enough <laughs> evaluation at all the stages. Yeah, so we might um, test something, maybe in an A-B test, or maybe yeah. we just roll out a new function or an upgrade. Yeah. But we don't always remember to set the parameters for what is going <coughs> and then monitor whether we hit them or not. Okay. So the next part is we're going to talk about which is know your users and understand them. And, it's, and this is typically something you're going to always hear, the user is the North Star. It's going to guide you. So anytime you have an argument within your team, you don't know what, it, what is the best thing to do, connect the feature to implement, what is the most important feature to do if you're doing Scrum, the priorities. Your opinion doesn't matter. You have to remember that. What, ma what matters is the user's opinion. So always focus on getting understanding on what the users want. Second point is empathy. <coughs> and empathy is trying to understand the user's feelings and putting kind of yourself in their shoes. I'm guilty of this. Who else actually said one point in their life? The user doesn't know how to use my application. It's his fault. They're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. We've all said it. I'm guilty of it as well. And this is not us being empathetic with you. We have to understand why they, they, they felt the way they felt, why they decided to tell you or vocalize their pain point. So that's an extremely important. So never say that. Try to put yourself in their shoes. That's gonna, that, that mentality will change how you approach anything, the bugs and uh, features, anything that you're developing uh, or designing. So the idea is, typically when you set out to do a, uh, your product and you want to build a product, you have an idea. But first of all, you got to do some research to understand the needs. And typically, this research could be using surveys. A lot of startups use that to actually uh, talk to the users, try to get understand their needs, and try to understand their problems, so what they want to solve. But that's an extremely important step. So you want to understand what the user needs so that you can actually build something relevant for them. And usually you want to think about different things. What do they need is one point. Uh, what do they hope for? What do they look for in an application? What do they expect from it? And also what are their constraints? If you're building something for the elderly, then you need to understand that there are certain constraints different. Or you're building something for a child, you have different constraints. So that's something to also look at when you're building for your user. Um, there's a typical situation that a lot of market-based startups go through, which is they have multiple user personas or multiple user types. And we always say you have to focus on one user. But uh, who thinks you should focus on both at the same time? Okay. And that's a big debate. And uh, the, uh, my point here of this slide is to tell you that ideally you want to have a primary user. That primary user should be driving your user experience process mostly. Uh, let's give a simple example of an app we all know, which is Uber. Who do you think is their primary user? Is it the driver or is it the passenger? Passenger. Both. 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 Um, in, okay. Um, so at the beginning, eventually Uber can evolve, and anybody evolves to change the primary to the secondary. At the beginning, their primary uh, user was a driver. And the simple reason is the driver is the one using the app the most. They actually need them to actually liquidate their market and have enough drivers so that the passenger, when they try to request an app, they get the correct user experience of getting a driver. So the app's user experience was focused mostly on the driver. The passenger the user experience is very simple. It's just a button, they all, I mean, it's just a button to get the car next to you. That's it. There's nothing else that you have to do as a passenger. 
you, when you go into the car, you don't press anything, you don't do anything. But you're getting the best user experience possible still because of the, the because of the idea as itself is that you just get into the car and don't do anything because the driver is dealing with all the buttons and the hassle and so on. Having a smooth experience for the driver allowed more drivers to join and allowed them to actually grow their market. So setting product goals on your based on your user needs. Okay. You know, if you, you figure out your need, now you want to put a product goal. Um, so there's going to be this idea that we're gonna, I'm going to mention a few times, which is to go wide, to go narrow, to test, and to iterate. And what does this really mean? First off is you want to go wide. So basically, you set your product vision. Okay. And I just want to talk about this uh, app for a second, which is called Soulmates. This app is for uh, the purpose of just testing and um, just you know, for the for as an exercise here. So it's an imaginary app that helps you shop within a store for shoes. That's the premise of the application. So it's going to help you, uh, you know, shop for for those shoes in the store. And one thing I want to talk about here specifically is the differentiation between the business needs and the user needs. So I'm going to start with a simple example. So let's say, typically speaking, this is a product goal we all have. We want to increase the sales that are happening for you. I mean, this is a very fair goal. We all look uh, and we all want to do increase our sales. It's fantastic. So we look at and we say, you know, the user is not completing purchases. They're getting to a point, they're browsing, but they're not completing purchases. So we're going to create, uh, we're going to put a home screen, uh, we're going to put a button on the home screen. That's a very simple, simplistic answer. But that's not really right, because what we said here is that the problem is with the user. We didn't talk about his needs. We just mentioned that there's a problem with the user. The user needs to do X so that we get Y. <coughs> that's what we're trying to do. And that's, that's also a mentality point that we'd like to change. We want to talk about the user needs. By the way, sorry, some of the slides are messed up. I think there's the font on their laptop is not installed. So apologies for that. Um, so we want to talk about the user needs and th that message, the messaging and the speaking of how of the problem with the user, you need to do something versus what do the user need and let's provide them with what they want, changes also your mentality on how you want to build the product. So these are some examples like uh, of bad examples. My personal favorite is we want to make our product viral via social media. So we're going to uh, link, uh, uh, attach the social media network accounts for the user and ask it to connect to them. I mean, the user never asks for it. What is his benefit? You're just throwing this in front of them, telling him, please connect, and give me your information. You're, if he needs it, if there's a purpose for it, yeah, but this is not us thinking first, user first. So other examples might be, you know, the user doesn't want to uh, wait for a long time in the store. So a good feature would be, or what I envision is, let's make it fast or easy to buy shoes in the store. So no, there's a user need, then there's a product goal. And then the third column here is talking about the potential feature, the feature that's going to solve that problem, which is maybe a barcode scan to actually get you to the store quick. That's an, an idea of a feature. So product visions, try to make them as uh, less as the uh, broad, as wide as possible. Remember we talked about being wide. A too detailed one would be this product uses image recognition from user provided photographs to render templates of the user's foot. This is extremely detailed. Okay. So next point is about idea generation. So we talked about going wide. Now we want to go narrow. And when you go narrow is we want to talk about features. So we have the idea that we want to buy shoes faster. So a good idea is to build a feature for that. And just want to do a quick definition of a feature. A uh, feature is not a page. Don't tell me that a sign in page is a feature by itself. The, the process of signing in is the feature. It might require multiple pages, or multiple screens, or multiple flows. The definition of a feature is it gets you from point A to point B. There's a state change that's happening. So a barcode scanning feature, for example, the user wants to look up an item, he doesn't know what the item it is, he executes that feature, now he has the item information. That's a, that's a feature that's getting you from one point to the other. So 
That's the example about soulmates. We, we, we found a product vision that our users need a smarter way to buy shoes in stores. And then, you know, we, we looked at the uh, persona of our soul users. They're actually in the store. So a good idea would be a barcode scanner to actually get them to, uh, to, to see the, the shoes. So after we do that process, we want to go uh, to a second point I want to talk about here is the paper prototyping. So let's say you came up with this barcode scanning idea. And it's just an idea. And we haven't wrote any single line of code. We're just you know, ideating. We're, sp we're speaking to the users, gathering feedback. And I want to gather feedback about that specific idea itself. So we want to, the, the thing is here is that paper prototyping works. Uh, sorry, okay. So now we want to test the flow. So we came up with the feature, we want to test the flow of the feature. And does this feature actually apply for the user and solve the problem for them? And to do that, the best idea is paper prototype. You don't have to be a designer to actually use paper prototyping. I started drawing, I cannot draw, but I can use paper prototypes to understand that the users, and if the users get my feature idea, my concept, I'm trying to validate this concept. So you, you gotta ask yourself here, what is the point A to point B? You draw the screens, uh, no matter how many they are, so to get the user from uh, to, to actually draw that feature and to draw the flow of the feature. Uh, it doesn't matter how many screens you gotta use, just show them. And you know, this is an example of the soulmates application that I'm gonna show now. <coughs> and you know. I mean, you can find your shoe size. There's a button here, and there's a barcode scanner, and then you can see the results of the scan. And you know, you can see that it's on its way, and then there you can buy it by in the last week. It's a very simple uh, idea to, to implement. It's going to take you 10 minutes to draw, and then you can directly you can go to any shoe store and you can start testing the concept. So just follow some of the design principles that are common for a mobile application. Uh, you know, just make the context clear. Let people understand what is it that you're providing them in the paper. What is the context where they are, their location. Try to explain the problem, where, uh, explain it to them better. And just use the standard buttons. Try to make it as simple as possible when you draw. Uh, any questions so far, guys? So user research. Um, so we talked about the user research idea before, and we want to talk about how we can. What are the different research techniques that are going to gather feedback for us from the users? And there are different. Uh, there are different uh, different techniques of research. They are qualitative and they are quantitative. Okay. And I'm going to start talking about the quantitative one. So you mentioned A-B testing. Somebody mentioned A-B testing before. Uh, what are other types of quantitative research that you guys are doing and implementing? Surveys. Surveys, OK. Clickbait. Sorry? Clickbait. Clickbait. I didn't hear it. Clickbait. Clickbait? OK. What is it? Uh, when you make a landing page, two landing pages, uh -huh. you know how many users uh, click on your site. Traffic. Okay. Traffic. Your site. OK, fine. Okay. What, what, what else? Is Sorry? You said A-B testing. Yeah. What is it? Uh, so typically speaking, in a development environment, you can create uh, two pages or two different pages for the same feature. And then you can see and you compare the metrics of how people engage with one versus the other. Direct interviews. Direct interviews. Uh, OK. Usually, usually these are on the qualitative side, not on the quantitative. Analytics. Analytics. Fantastic. Example. One thing that's extremely important when doing quantitative is you need to understand, have a benchmark. I mean, there are numbers, but those numbers need to mean something, need to be compared to something else. So, example of A-B testing, you can create a sample pool and provide them with a different screen and test with that screen. But it's extremely important to create, to have a benchmark of the numbers. One very interesting thing about quantitative, usually you get numbers in percent, right? Uh, just a quick reminder that percent is per 100. So I get a lot of startups that apply to Speed and they're like, yeah, we created surveys and we talked to people and 95% love what I'm doing. How many people? 20. 
might do that. Don't, if you're going to use the percentage sign, just have 100 people at least. Please. Sorry? Yeah, it's a big difference. So uh, there's a big difference. So let, try to have 100 people at least when you're doing quantitative. So now I jump to qualitative. Um, one thing also I want to talk about is quantitative. It tells you what's going on. So the metrics and the analytics, you guys uh, can spend hours on the Google Analytics looking at where, where users are dropping off, what's happening. Uh, study the funnels and see the drop offs. But you're not going to know why this is happening. So you know what's going on, but you're going to need the qualitative to support you on what's why this is happening. What? Listen. Exactly. So, but, but you need to use a combination of both. Don't use one type of research over the other. So that's one type, which is the quantitative. Now the qualitative. Anybody's doing qualitative research? Interviews. What types? Interviews. Interviews. Okay. Interviews. Okay. Focus groups. Somebody mentioned them. Yeah, focus groups. Mm -hmm. Sit behind somebody who's using the application and see what he's doing and where he's facing problems. Fantastic. So one-on-one -on -one interviews, trying to see their. Uh, okay. Great. So these are the typical ideas. And, and in combination, the qualitative and the quantitative is going to be extremely important to get you to the right stage to understand uh, the user and to get the correct feedback from Sorry, what's diary study? Sorry? What does diary study mean on the uh, Diary, I think that user kind of writes down everything that's happening with them, and then you analyze it later on. So it's a special type of Shadow is similar to what he's yeah. talked about. You stay with the user all the time and you're with them all the time. Wow. I'm going to talk about, uh, so there's different types, and I'm going to talk about a few types of research. And I'm going to talk about surveys, because surveys are a bit unique. They're actually both qualitative and quantitative. It depends on how you're asking your questions. So typically, in a survey, you can have multiple choice questions as you're trying to figure out what the users uh, you know, uh, interests are, so you can end up having percentage, multiple choice. So that's kind of more quantitative. But qualitative, in the survey, you have open-ended questions, trying to get feedback, trying to get them to express themselves in those, uh, in the studies. So it's, it, it, it's kind of a mix of both. Um, one thing I just want to highlight about surveys is that I see this mistake also happen often with a lot of startups, which is that they ask a question that's a kind of a trap question, and they get the 95% people who said yes. So you get startups and 95% of people would buy my product, I ask them, and they're like, what's the question? If I, I, there's an app that will save you time, money, and energy, will you, uh, will you use it? Who's going to say no to that? So you got to kind of have to Ask fair questions. Don't ask leading questions. And that's a very ex important point when doing surveys. And it's extremely hard. Extremely hard. I know that. But always think about, am I leading the user to IS? Am I trying to get validation from the user? Or am I trying to understand them? Because a lot of, a lot of the times, we are not confident about the app that we're building. And we want people to say yes. We want to feel good about it. When, when you put on your research hat, it's not about feeling good. It's about figuring out the right information and the answers to your questions. So I want to talk about two other types of testing and are their uh, research, which is concept testing and usability testing. And there's one important point is that paper prototypes are low fidelity. They're not high fidelity. So you cannot test usability. You can test the concept. So basically, you want to test if this concept or the idea or the actually is interesting for the user. Right? If you want to test usability, you're going to have to have medium to high fidelity prototypes. That's when Adobe XD and the prototyping tools come in. So that's closer to the building stage. You've kind of validated the concept. You think that people are interested in it. They like it. Now let's go and do usability. You, talk, you start comparing sliders. You start looking at color and color differences. But you don't do that at the paper prototype stage. Each type of testing has a purpose. So one thing here I'm going to, uh, it's a kind of a trick or a shortcut, is that when doing specifically usability tests, not concepts, usability, testing with five people provides you with 85% of the problem. So when you're going and doing usability tests, you don't have to test with 100 people. 
And this is kind of uh, numbers that came from uh, Nielsen, which is a very reputable data analyst uh, research source. Mm -hmm. And they detect that 80%, 85% are uh, you, with five people you can find all the issues, the usability. So that's kind of a neat trick, but it doesn't apply to the paper prototypes. So that's why I want to make a clear distinction between the both of them. So I want to go through an example of concept testing, and I'm going to do an example of uh, the, the app, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer to come up with me here on stage. No one? Zero? Yellow? Yeah. So the idea here, I want to simulate a user interview. Let's say I have the actual papers printed out in front of me, and I'm trying to show her the, those papers. And so actual technique of talking to the, per, to the person is extremely difficult, and you can do a lot of good things, and you can do a lot of bad things. So I'm going to try to, to show you both sides. Okay. Uh, so hi, I'm Fares. <coughs> I created this application, and, I'm, uh, uh, and I've been working on it for over a year now, and I love it. Extremely excited about it, and I have built, uh, and I want to get your idea about it. Okay, so this is the first screen, and you're shopping for shoes at the store. What do you see? Okay, first, I want to explain to you what I see. How I'm going to use. Yeah, just you're a user now, and I'm testing, and I'm doing this with you, this exercise. Okay, here's my profile. So I think I need to fill my information. Okay, fine. Doesn't matter. Uh, there's a button. You see the button? Okay. This is a button. Yes, this is a button. Exactly. So you're going to tap the button, correct? Correct. Great, fantastic. Okay. And uh, then I think I have to take a picture of my shoes. Okay. Shoes. So you're going to scan it, and then you're going to jump to the next screen. Yes. Yeah, the shoes you like. The shoes she likes. Well, this is the point. Yes, the point. I understand. This is the point. Yeah, this is the point. This is my shoes. Okay. That's yeah, you're going to scan. It's great, fantastic. Okay. And then so you're going to go to the next screen. Yeah, you're on the next screen now. What happened? Okay. Uh, I think I will see the same shoes I took a picture of. Yeah, it's the same shoes. And then there's an ask clerk here. Yeah, there's an ask clerk. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to, I can change uh, and check the time. Okay, okay. There's an ask clerk. So we jump to the ask clerk. And there's Tony here, right? And what happens here? Okay, so Tony is my driver. The driver is going to get you. No. <laughs> No, come on, he's the person who's doing the, he's going to get you the shoes, he's not a driver, he's in the store. Come on, what are, what, what's going on here? No, I don't get for that. Okay, fair. And if you get the, if you wait for Tony, what's going to happen next? Uh, now I understand that Tony is the driver, but he's the person who's in the store searching for my shoe. And then he's going to... Give me the one I asked for, the illet, as you know, uh, exactly. the color I chose. And, and then you're going to buy it eventually at Pesimo. Okay. And I can. Okay. Can you stand there for a second? Who thinks I was a good interviewer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, why was I a horrible interviewer? You because you let her. Okay. So I was leading her. I was leading her in the interview. What else? Yeah, you weren't actually listening to her feedback. You're just like. No, no, you're not giving her time. Tell me what you want. I was just happy to just get, get her through this, and I just didn't care about what she's saying. Okay, mom, yeah. I'm so. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm going to go through actually a more proper way of doing an interview. So hi, my name is Faris, and I've been asked by, by the developers of this application to actually do some uh, studies about, uh, you know, uh, they use uh, about the app, and they're interested in opinion of users. Okay. okay. So uh, for the purpose of this, I would like you to assume that we're actually in a store, and you're shopping for your shoes, and uh, you find the shoe that you might like. Okay. And then you decide to open the application, and you're uh, shown this first screen here. So what do you see? Okay, uh, fill my uh, information, personal okay. information. Uh, 
show you if it's clickable or not. I'm going to tell you that this is not clickable. Okay, this is playing you. What I see is that this yeah. looks like a button. Okay, great. But more like we don't have. Yeah, okay. Great. Okay, so I have to scan the shoes I like. So, okay, so you press the button or yes, not here? Yes, Okay, right? so you press the button to find exactly. yourself. Fantastic. Yeah, and then uh, I scan the shoes. All right. Okay, which uh, takes me here. Um, only they're going to show me if there is from this shoes mm -hmm. in stock been sized the enough. Okay. Okay. So, you, so you're assuming here is that if, if the size you like, they're going to show you. They're going to show you only if your size is yes. matched. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. And then uh, choose the color. In which color will be? Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, I'm only, I never had the chance to look at this because you know when come in, I can uh, find. Okay. This shoes be great places. Different colors. Yes, All right. Okay. Ask clerk. Oh, so you're going to press the ask button. Yes. Uh, can I and, uh, ask what are, you, what are you looking for to happen here when you press the button? I'm looking uh, for finding the particular shoes I chose in the color I chose and okay. the size okay. available. Okay. 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 So now we press on the ask third. Now we have this message here, uh, the screen. Okay. Uh, I think in the school, Mark Okay. So Tony is the person who will have on the mobile to check, let's say. Okay. Okay. Interesting as well. Okay. So Tony will look for the shoes. Okay. And then I'm going to have the real one. Alright. What you were looking for. Okay. Alright. The price. Uh, occupation by phone. Okay. Do you have anything else you would like to uh, comment about this? Uh, um, Would you use it if it was available to you in the store? Uh, yes, why not? Okay. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, we can answer it. Yeah. I, I don't get this because uh, why would I use an app to scan a shoe if it's she I'm going to have a human interaction? Why is it a clerk to the shoe? Okay. Why don't I just ask the clerk? Get to my size. So, so two, two, two things happen here. First of all, she assumed that these are, if I was taking notes correctly, she assumed that these are things that she has to enter, that she enters. But they already entered. So this is basically her profile screen. She already set up her profile beforehand. Second, this is a waiting screen. You don't, you're not talking to Tony. It's an app that's downloaded on your mobile device. And Tony will show up. He already has two people ahead of you. You have to wait five minutes, so Tony will show up with the actual shoe okay. in hand. You haven't spoken to a single human being yet. Yes, but Tony is going to get me the shoes at the end of the day. It's not like it's a machine that can get yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, this is not, that's why you probably don't see this application actually no, available. Okay, okay. okay. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. I'm just used to a machine. No, but the idea is that you don't have to wait for the clerk to ask him what size you want. I'm going to wait because I'm going to kill both of the Yeah, but I mean, that, 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 but you go, but I'm going to ask him, 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 i am going to ask him 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 i does this concept work or not? Will it get you to, to actually, is it useful enough for the user or not? And she said she might be interested, but she was, she was a bit reluctant. And that's something in how she answered the question. It's an indication as well uh, about that. Uh, Link is an automated delivery service. And then I remove mean, the waiting time, and then yeah. it all goes through. Okay. Exactly. The, 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 uh, I mean, you know, a lot of people they, uh, might be happy with those features, but my, the, the goal here for me is not to actually uh, go through the concept itself. It's the process of interview itself. So what I, what I, what did I do well here? What did I do good? You gave her time to talk. You listen. You listen. Okay. And you weren't emotional in your introduction. The first one was, I love it, I'm so excited. Exactly. So, so th that's a very neat trick, by the way. Typically, people, humans uh, usually don't want to be mean to you. 
So if you tell them I'm building this application, they're more likely to not be honest with you. They're more likely to be nice, like, yeah, yeah it's cool, oh, I like it, but then, you know, they don't care. But if, if it's someone else that's building the app and you ask the question, they're more likely to be themselves. So that's a very nice trick to use when you're doing that. Another thing is, I try to make sure she understands the location. I think I could have done it even better to show, tell her that this is an app that you have downloaded previously. Maybe that could have gotten the setting to be even better than it was right now. But kind of set, set up the idea of where she is and then she's in the store. And you know, letting her speak, letting her speak in your mind is extremely important. So I want to let the user say what they have and write them down. And there's a lot of things I realized, you know, we've done this exercise many times, by the way, and there's always somebody comes up with a new thing that we never even thought about. So uh, it's pretty cool. So the, so the, the, the idea of the concept the clerk is not with you. It's an app that you download on your phone and you go into the store and then you want to, you want to shoot with your size. I mean, the, the, the app doesn't exist, guys. It's an example. Uh, and uh, by the way, 10% uh, royalty for me if you guys uh, end up coming in. Hala, let's be clear. I mean, come on, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not about the shoe, right? It's, it's, not, it's not about the shoe. It's just about the idea of the... Yeah, short question. Yeah, short question. Yeah, short question. Yeah, short I mean, surveys are, I mean, each part is a different stage you want to use. You know, you, you can use surveys to actually start with the idea of understanding the user needs, you know, at the beginning, and trying to come up with a product code, and that's where you want to use using surveys a lot more. And the more you have a product, and the more you have, uh, it's built, and the, when the product is available, you can integrate different types, like the A-B testing, like the analytics, try to measure them. But you can also introduce surveys down the line eventually. So surveys can come in at different stages. And gathering feedback can come in at different stages. The idea is, guys, we will always want to uh, come back and uh, get the feedback from the user. Whatever stage we're at in the cycle. Implementing a, a send your feedback feature inside the app. Yeah. Is it a good practice? Yeah, I mean, you know, if it's not intrusive to the user and uh, if it's there for the user, it's a it's a great resource for you guys to actually uh, get information from the users. You know? Some teams even uh, provide you with bonuses for the feedback to incite you to bring feedback. But now that kind of ruins some of the feedback because some people just send random characters because all they want is that bonus. So there's a trade off as well in that. If you, if you launch a prototype version to get to see what the people have problems with, what types of problems uh, will that be? A prototype? I mean, the yeah. first prototype is your paper. That could be a prototype. Yeah, but if you launch it, a yeah. lot of people ask you, you know, what are the problems you Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the later stage. That's typically after you launch, you're going to rely on the analytics, you're going to uh, try different techniques, you're going to also want to do those user research, but now not with the paper, with the actual application. You're going to you're going to look at the analytics and you're going to see certain drop-offs, certain behaviors that you were not expecting the user to be doing. Like suddenly at the home page, you're going to see them browse a lot, you're going to see them adding to the cart, but you're going to look at and see that 95% don't complete the purchase. And you're going to be like, why? You're not going to know that until you actually go and figure it out. There might be a major usability problem that you haven't even noticed, or they might not understand how to complete the purchase correctly. There might be different constraints that they're going through that you haven't even thought about. So, that's kind of the, the flow. Right? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> not for for not for the paper prototypes. It's for the usability testing specifically. So the difference between concept testing and usability testing is that for the concept, we're trying to understand that people like what they see and they would use it. The usability is actually trying to test if the design of the app itself and the look and feel and the components actually make sense for the user. So if it's, does this slider make sense or should I have a drop down or a radio button? 
these are the type of things where, this, where the button should be green or red for buying. And these, these are more for usability. But with five to eight people, you can get to a very high percentage of errors uh, that you can count. Okay, uh, uh, is there any uh, conditions that we gain? There are an audience that we choose, but are, uh, should, be, should, should they be different? Uh, like, uh, different they have a different background? So, I mean, if you are testing, uh, if you have a persona in mind, and you want to test for the, you test with the persona. So you're not going to test with somebody who doesn't, who never going to use your application. I, I understand, but uh, should they be, uh, they are in the audience, but should they, they be from a different background? Uh, if it matters to your product, yes, maybe. But the uh, idea is that, typically speaking, you create a persona for your product, you understand, for, for the persona for your users, and you're building for their needs, for that specific persona, the one persona, the primary one that you're testing. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. It's irrelevant. Really, really. Maybe the background is a factor of whether they're in this user persona or not, but that's something. Um, there's just one note that, you know, that will be, uh, uh, we, the, the Google guys keep, love to give us an example during the training. And one of the simplest examples was, uh, if you give the user what they want, everything else follows which is typically monetization or anything else like that. And the simplest example is probably Gmail. Who remembers when Gmail was launched back in 2004, I think? Anybody? OK. Not everybody's that old. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So but back then, it was probably April's food. They created an email that was one gigabyte in size. Back then, Hotmail was two, or two and then you have to do a cap to make it 25 megabytes. So we moved from 25 megabytes to one gigabytes. That's a big jump, all right? It's very costly for them, but you know what? Everybody moved to Gmail, and they by, by they on. gave the user what he wanted. They gave the user what he wanted. And later on, they figured out how to monetize, and then they built their enterprise software around Gmail and all that, everything else. But you get the user, things follow eventually. So focus on the user is a very important uh, mentality that Google usually uses uh, all their products. So speaking of Google, so the idea of the master class is that the first thing is, if you apply to the master class and you get accepted, you're going to be, uh, these, this is similar to the material that we're going, uh, the material I just showed is from the master class, but we go a lot deeper into the techniques of the research and also the work with the team to actually figure out how you can actually do this in your day-to-day -day jobs at your work. So after you go through the master classes itself, then you can actually go through teacher training. So we're also including teachers to expand this effort. Right now there are six teachers uh, that are doing this, but eventually we want to have more because we want to spread Google's uh, initiative to spread more best practices of UX in the MENA region. So there's a chapter now in Tunis, there's one in Lebanon, and we hope to expand it over this chapter. And eventually, once you go through the teacher training, you can actually train uh, new teachers eventually. So uh, we invite you actually to join the GTG uh, community group, which is the Google uh, developer group in Lebanon. You can see their website at gtgcostlebanon.com. You can join their meet, uh, the meetup. And you're probably going to set up a, ma a mailing list so that you guys can sign up for the updates of the mailing list. OK, and uh, uh, join there and try to, if you're interested in actually the actual master class, please talk to me after the class. Uh, Ideally, we want teams to have at least four members, okay, so that they can actually learn those techniques well. You know. So teams should be from four to six members. Okay. So this is my email. If you have any questions for me, you can feel free to contact me. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.